Welcome to Movie Time Machine, where each episode we take a movie from the past and we're living in the present. This week's movie, Contact, released in the summer of 1997, directed by Robert Zemeckis, starring Jodie Foster and Matthew McConaughey. I'm your Time Machine host, Chad, surrounded by my Time Machine friends, Lee, Jamie. All right. For the last couple episodes, I've been throwing it out there saying that uh, we're all going to go around and pick... Uh, one of our favorite movies uh, this week. It's your turn, Lee, and you pick Contact. So why don't you give us some input on why Contact is one of your favorite movies? All right, thanks, Chad. Yeah, I uh, picked this movie uh, mainly because I like the interaction of the science and the religion. I grew up in a religious household, and I've always been interested in science and that aspect of life. And I just like the the dichotomy of the two, you know, where they correlate, where they oppose or butt heads. And I think this movie, in my opinion, really expresses it tremendously. I mean, it's just, it's just one of those, uh, it's one of those movies that it just seems to just come together and they have that central focus and that's pretty much it. And then you get this all, all this other extra, you know, relationships and, you know, just all, all this other stuff that happens too. So all the, you know, so that's me. The main reason why I did pick this movie, I have absolutely no idea where the first time I saw this movie was. Yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, I just remember seeing it must've been on home video back in 97. I don't think I went to the theater to see this. Okay. So, you know, I had, uh, I'm pretty sure I'd watched Forrest Gump, you know, so I was, oh, I was familiar with uh, Zemeckis and I'm familiar with Zemeckis because of, uh, you know, the back to the back future, future trilogy for Definitely. sure. But this one, it's, uh, it was just one of those, well, Zemeckis directed it. I know something about Carl Sagan where he did uh, Cosmos and I'm like, well, I'm going to give it a shot, you know? I hadn't really heard a lot about it, but I ended up really enjoying it. Right. And over the years, I ended up really loving it. So, Awesome. Next up, let's open up the box office. All right. So in order to um, take a deeper look into this, I mean, it's not that deep. I literally am just pulling up the top 10 box office films for 1997. Um, let's see. I'll just rip off the first 10 until we get to contact which turns out was number 16 for the year um in order we have titanic men in black lost world jurassic park liar liar air force one as good as it gets goodwill hunting star wars special edition number nine my best friend's wedding number 10 tomorrow never dies number 11 face off 12 batman and robin 13 george of the jungle 14 scream 2 15, Con Air, and 16, Contact. And just for fun, I'm going to go through and pick which ones were part of a franchise at the time. This does not include Men in Black, as that was the first film of that eventual franchise. So by my count, we have The Lost World, Jurassic Park, sequel, uh, Star Wars, clearly, but that's a re-release, so I don't know if that truly counts. Um, Tomorrow Never Dies, Dies, and Batman and Robin. I guess George of the Jungle is a remake or reimagining of that cartoon yeah. and then scream 2 is obviously a sequel so here are the sequels yeah and i think you'd be lucky this year if you look at the top box office to get one original film right and yeah. um yeah i just kind of wanted to highlight that because lee i going through this list and when you recommended contact i i, I was aware of it obviously pop culture wise it had an impact but i i'd never seen it and then looking at this list it was clear to me that i've seen almost every other film on this list except contact so i just was wondering how that one kind of slipped through the cracks for me and i I don't have a good answer um but i just was interesting to point out yeah the first 10 movies for sure i've seen yeah it's, uh, most of them i saw in the theater too yeah i remember quite a few of those in the theater i was only let's see seven or eight years old but i still remember quite a few of those from the theater you know it was 
I think it was really hard to get around Titanic that year. Yeah. I mean, because it... That it, movie came out mid-December of that year. It was, wasn't it? Yeah. So sometimes when I look at the... At the um, or, or was it 96 that it came out, December? And it just, yeah, it just blew up. Oh, yeah. December 19th, 1997. That's okay. when it came out. Holy crap. Wow, so sweet. this right here... Oh, yeah, highest grossing films... That's so. ridiculous. Because <laughs> I thought, like, well, at least in this, it, during the release, though, like, Contact yeah. was doing all right. It came out the week after Men in Black. Um, Men in Black, I think, killed it. Yeah, like, I'm sure. Weeks on end. It was, like, I think, oh, like, yeah. one of the top movies for at least a month. Yeah. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but um, it was it seemed like Contact was always there. Then it kind of, like, always trickled down. But it, there was it, always these other bigger films. And, like, Lost World, I think, came out shortly after that. It, it seems like it just got lost. Yeah. Yeah. In yeah. the mix, basically. Yeah. Just a great year, it sounds like. Yeah, that's a yeah. hell of a movie year. Yeah. You know, I guess for the sequels, you know, it could have been, you know, some were better than others, but yeah. yeah. Some of the original movies were pretty awesome, like Men in Black. I, I love that movie. Oh, yeah. And I, I mean, some of these sequels, I, I'm a, I'm a Bond diehard, so Tomorrow mm-hmm. Never Dies isn't my favorite in the franchise, but... I I still I find it watchable and um, mm-hmm. Scream Two I love that franchise I think Scream Two still holds up that's a great great film in my opinion and Batman and Robin I choose not to say anything more about that one <laughs> was that the last one Yeah I, that was the Schumacher with, Schwarzenegger Uma yeah. Thurman was it Clooney that was rough Yeah yeah that yes was, that was the Clooney right. that was the <laughs> bat nipple era Yeah. <laughs> awful yeah i remember i did see that in the theater too and yeah i was i think i fall asleep during it <laughs> it was terrible yeah. well it was weird because the one before that was val kilmer yeah, yeah. you know forever. which that's one of jamie's favorite batmans that's not true <laughs> <laughs> that was joel schumacher too i believe but it was yeah. i remember clooney talking about that uh, you know, being Batman, he's like, yep, I am the franchise killer. <laughs> but, <laughs> that's so, awesome. Just own it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> could that be the worst movie he's ever been in? It could be. I think he was, he he must have been referencing maybe another series he was in. I just can't remember right offhand, you know. I'd, yeah. have, I'd have to look it up. But All right. Yeah, Thank so you for a box office breakdown. So let's just go over a quick synopsis of the film, and then we'll start getting into our favorite scenes here. Okay, the synopsis for Contact. Dr. Ellie Arroway, after years of searching, finds conclusive radio proof of extraterrestrial intelligence sending plans for a mysterious machine back to Earth. This morning's detection of an unidentified radio source from deep space can neither be confirmed nor denied. Whatever it is, it ain't local. Position? I checked interferometry somewhere in Lyra, I think. Uh, Vega? Can't be. It's only 26 light years away. I want all these people out of here. Your having sent this announcement all over the world may well constitute a breach of national security. Oh, this isn't a person-to-person call. This may be an announcement to get our attention. The president has called an emergency meeting. You know those interlaced frames that we thought were noise? This says structure. I'm going to recommend to the president that we militarize this project immediately. There's no reason to believe that their, their intentions are hostile. There's no proof of that. Why don't they just speak English? Mathematics is the only truly universal language. Center. Buried within the message itself is the key to decoding it. Those look like engineering schematics, almost like blueprints. It is our belief that the message contains instructions for building some kind of machine. A machine? It might turn out to be some kind of a transport. Transport? The fact is, you don't know what it does. It could be anything. Nobody's saying this isn't dangerous. They're going to build it. Who gets to go, though? It's complicated, Ellie. Who gets to go? By doing this, you're willing to risk your life. You're willing to give your life and die for this. Why? I have a few favorite scenes. I don't know which one to really start out with, but I'll just maybe start sequentially in the movie. Just like when this movie first started, just the scene where you're starting on Earth and it starts like panning back and you're going through like the solar, like all the planets in the solar system. Then you're like, you're leaving like the Milky Way galaxy. Then you start seeing all like these other galaxies in the the image and like the you start losing like the radio signals and everything just gets quiet and 
then it finally pans out. Then it's like you go through the eye of Ellie as a child at her shortwave radio trying to communicate. Um, and it's kind of showing like these bonding moments with her father. But <clears throat> just to start with that, that image of like, it just reminds me of that one of the first like Hubble telescope images where it's like, it just looks like an image of a bunch of stars, but all those stars are actually galaxies. And just thinking like each one of those galaxies, like our Milky Way galaxy is estimated to be like 105 light years across in like a screen of galaxies that could be just as big and expanse as filling the screen. This gives you like that ultimate, like I'm like, <laughs> I'm kind of like nothingness of like how just how vast the universe is. And I think that was the, at that time it was like the longest CGI scene. In yeah, a movie. I, I believe you're correct on that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, that the beginning was it was pretty awesome. It just it, it just has the title credits or the title and all of a sudden it's just bam. Yeah. Just all this yep. noise and just hustle and bustle of earth. Yeah, and it just slowly you just kinda drops go off. Go back through time as yep, it and you're like, back yep, through the yeah, actually, system. Yeah, and then you hear uh like Richard Nixon, you know, around like Saturn or Mars, somewhere yeah. in there, you know, Richard right. Nixon talking, <laughs> and then, you know, yeah, exactly. Was, were they not was, by Uranus when we were listening to Nixon? Well, they could have been. They oh, sort of should have been. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe like, um, but, oh, did you have something to add? Jamie? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I um, <laughs> I thought about that opening scene as well because, well, on a couple levels, there's, I mean, obviously the Carl Sagan. Um, the Carl Sagan-ness of it all. You know, you can't help but think of Cosmos, and we're going through the ship of the imagination across the galaxy and the known universe. So I, that that was a cool callback to his show, his really his life work. Um, but then I started thinking about um, where where do I lose context of our known universe? And I tapped out like right around uh, after Saturn. Like I was, <laughs> I was looking for Uranus and Neptune and I don't recall seeing them in the movie. That doesn't mean that they weren't there, but yeah, I mean, once we get outside the Milky way, I just wonder, I, I know that there's scientists who, you know, have that greater map in their mind, right. but I wonder if you could actually see those two planets, you know, but I'm just, we're watching and I, I you know, a fairly good sized TV nowadays, but it's still, you know, still pretty small. You know, that's actually a really good point. I didn't even think of that, but yeah, I, I, I was streaming this. So I was watching it on my laptop and then my phone due to connectivity issues. <laughs> I felt like I did myself a disservice <laughs> watching it that way, but I think you're onto something, Lee. I wonder if I, that didn't play a, a part. You know, I, I, I don't know either because I hadn't seen it in the theater. So that's true too. Yeah. So I just, uh, First TV I ever saw it on was probably just, you know, a little 25 inch or maybe. Right. But uh, outside of that, I think, um, I guess what I'm going to pick two scenes here is um, another scene where I like it for multiple reasons. It's the scene, it's another flashback scene uh, for Ellie. It's right after her and like uh, McConaughey's character, is it Joss? Palmer Palmer or Palmer. Yeah. Palmer, yeah. Um, so she like gets up and leaves and like, she has this flashback to her father and uh, it's her like on like the, the deck of her home and she's calling for her dad and he's not responding. And like, she's walking downstairs and like, there's like spilt popcorn on the floor and like watching through the commentary, like the popcorn, the first speckles of it is like in the shape of the big dipper but um gets down there she sees her father then it's her running back up the stairs to grab his medication and just that whole scene as she runs up then she's running towards the camera just how that shot because once she gets up to that main floor everything kind of brightens up and she, as she gets closer to the camera you see her reach and it's it's her reflection in the cabinet door medicine cabinet door as it opens and it's just one of the coolest scenes and, and shots. And I was just like trying to watch on how like that, that was made. And, but it's pretty awesome. And kind of just like another touching scene, just, you know, all these moments, I feel like in the first half of the movie, it's kind of all these moments is, is how you're kind of seeing how Ellie is like connecting to all these things with her father and like, what's kind of driving her up to that moment where we get like the first contact with her. But, um, 
also like a, there's always for me i'm just seeing like these like you're kind of seeing like these moments where like ellie is just always like alone it's kind of like this theme of being alone i know she's with her father but it kind of starts out too in the, the very beginning of the movie her like wanting to reach out to her mother or like on the cross the shortwave radio and um i can maybe touch on this later but just for me it just kind of was this theme of uh of being alone but i just thought that scene in general was really 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 cool then like right after that like it's the uh <clears throat> the scene with her and the priest or the father is talking with her and, and gives her like one of the spiels of like, you know, like, you know, we don't have a, you know, we don't, sometimes these things just, you know, we don't know what reason these things happen for. It's just, or like it's God's will. And like her response is just like, no, if the medication was in the bathroom downstairs, then I could have saved my father kind of thing. And it kind of gives a, this whole character development of Ellie. She's just very like, like logical and like if this was like this then this would have happened like it's not it kind of shows through the movie like her <clears throat> you know do you think no, like yeah just no like belief in like god or just pushing that it's just like it's not proven and that's not the reason why this happened you yeah. know do you think that she she's using the medication as a way of controlling her father's death I think that's Jodie Foster had mentioned that in the commentary that that was like her motivation. I never thought of that before. That's I had heard that. Yeah, where she, she, she basically takes charge of him dying because the medication wasn't where it was supposed to be. It's kind of weird. It's kind of bizarre to think in hmm. that respect. I don't know. I didn't come up with that theory. That was Jodie yeah. Foster's motivation for her character. Wow. But I didn't, I didn't see that. Yeah. At all. It was like almost like a controlling thing. Yeah. Wow. Well, in yeah. the sense they, that, they in the sense where the pre priest would have been totally wrong. Right. It will. And also that <clears throat> she had, um, that much more responsibility maybe than the priest realized. Is that kind of what she was driving at? I think so. Okay. Right. I can, I see that now. Yeah, definitely. And that, that, I did. I did enjoy that scene too. Yeah. It, yeah, you know, it's it is is very sad, but it it gives you a lot in just that short amount of time of like her, like who she is, her yeah. motivations, and everything yep. in this movie. Yeah, that's true because the priest he's recon reconciling it obviously in his religious way that he does and. Uh, not Jody, but um, Jenna Malone, I guess, is the character then, via yeah. Jody or vice versa. Who's saying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, like you didn't see the variables. Like the scientific variables were medicine cabinet. I right. knew where they were. That's the equation, and I didn't. I didn't get there it fast in time. Enough, yeah. yeah. You know, and he, it, he kind of talks down to her, where she doesn't need to be talked down to at all. Right. Because you find out later that she graduated like two years early yeah from high school right and she actually magna cum laude from mit and... yeah we learn all this when it goes through <laughs> so, like the scene with had and like i've been following you yep. follow tracking my investments <laughs> yeah <laughs> isn't hurt <laughs> awesome yeah <laughs> anyway all right well that's like my scene or two um jamie why don't you go ahead with, with some of your favorite scene or scenes of this movie yeah um i had a couple one of them was when they were at their first site, um, when Ellie goes to Puerto Rico, I had to look it up. And this is another one of the moments where I stopped the film because that place that they're at, I believe it's called the Arecibo Satellite. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Arecibo Radio Telescope. Yep. And yeah. being a Bond fan that I am, yep. I, Goldeneye was the first thing I thought of because... There's that <laughs> there's that final scene um, where they're in the in the film Goldeneye they say they're in Cuba but really they're in Puerto Rico that's where the satellite is so yeah I I just being that this film was in 1997 and although Goldeneye came out first I like to think that you know after Ellie's project got shut down and they left Trevelyan took over the satellite <laughs> and then <laughs> Bond came in and had to reckon with that so. Being in that universe is fun for me. Just 
these are the things I think of when I should probably be watching the movie. Um, so <laughs> finding that was cool. And um, yeah, similarly, the very large array in New Mexico, just the shots of those alone are incredible. And kind of that's like the science stuff you mentioned, Lee, that we just, I don't think we get to see enough. You know, it's either on Nova that we don't seek out more than we maybe should. That's pretty cool. But um, lastly, I was thinking about the scene where um, Tom Skerritt is going to go for the test run in the machine. And maybe I'm getting my scenes mixed up. I'm thinking about the one where they're all gathered, like when people come from miles to the site to kind of see it. And this movie... Oh, like the big Vega encampment? Yeah, yeah, the Vega encampment. Oh, yeah, they're in New Mexico. Yep. Oh, they're at the yeah. very large yeah, array? Yep, they're yeah. back at the New Mex- Mexico array. Okay, Yeah, when right. they have everybody gathered. Yeah, yeah. you're yeah. right. And that's, I, I think, kind of the other thing I liked about this movie, there's moments where it's very clear that it's a movie, but also, oh, yeah, this is what would happen if we made contact with an extraterrestrial. Like, all of these people would show up and... You would get everybody. You'd get the Christians. You'd get the Nazis. You'd just get the onlookers. You'd get the scientists. And so that was very cool, being aware of that's what what, what it would look like, all those people gathered there, and then also just seeing Jake Busey as a religious nutbag. Right. That, those are the fun movie parts <laughs> in addition to that yeah. that I kind of get a kick out of. Yeah. And that, that definitely was the focus, too, of her yeah just by how he was like basically singling her out yeah out of the whole crowd you know she just happened to like focus in on him yeah it was what a foreshadow too but i didn't realize what was going to happen with his character i didn't either i I was curious where that was going too yeah did anybody notice that there were uh, cars named vague there was a model of car there, and there was several of them, Vegas. Oh, really? No, I didn't. <laughs> no, I missed that. that, too. Yeah, there, <laughs> there was, like, a car club, and must have been a Vega car club. I think Chevy made them or something. So, like, and a real 70s, car was... Oh, there's a real yeah. car named oh, a Vega. Oh, no way. I had no idea. I, <laughs> I do remember the scene where, like, the, the car guys, though, like... Yeah, those yeah. were Vegas. Yeah, oh, they were like okay. I think there were two or four doors. My dad had one. Yeah, That's something sweet. you you it was nice. just a kind of a crappy car in the seventies, you know. <laughs> then I guess it was like a cruise or something. Some similar along the same lines, but that was kind of funny seeing those things. Oh, that's a cool callback. I didn't realize. And there was the, cars. I remember like the, there was the Elvis, right? That says Viva Viva Las Vega. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the and there's like the choir, like the Hail to Vega song, like done in hello, yeah. uh, whatever, like hallelujah, like hail to Vega, hail to Vega. <laughs> I feel compelled. Jesus is an alien. Or yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I feel compelled to clarify too, while or why I mentioned the Nazis. That's because of the broadcast that they sent in yes. to space that his yeah. Hitler, for those who are unaware of the. Um, the actual first, implications of that that was the first tv broadcast television, worldwide television broadcast. yeah it was the first high-powered broadcast right it, and was, it was at the, the 1936 olympics, olympics. Yep. olympic games yeah that would have been the same olympic games that jesse owens yeah was at and won several gold medals suck it hitler yeah and hitler just did not want to meet him <laughs> America. <laughs> but I, apparently Hitler does live on Vega. <laughs> according to them. <laughs> That's right. So, yeah. All right. That's it That's for it. me. That's it for favorite Danny. scenes, yeah. All right. And on to Lee. Well, no one took my favorites. I I like the the New Mexico array when they actually uh she finds a she has she's listening and she actually hears the the broadcast the message and the way Zemeckis sets it up it's just perfect cuz she's lost everything at once again you know they're going to they got like 3 months that's it and there's like no other there's no hope for her to do anything beyond that 3 months because she's already burnt through all the bridges and Haddon can't do anything for her anymore because the government's basically not going to allow her to do continue with her studies. God, a fucking drumlin. 
Yeah, adrenaline. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? <laughs> we we'll get to so, that later, but. Yeah, no kidding. So, yeah, she's just sitting there. Just on her car, you know, car hood, and she's like half asleep, and all of a sudden she just kind of hears it, and I just love how Zemeckis just goes right into her eyes, and all of a sudden, bing, her eyes open up, yeah, and then all hell just breaks loose, and she's just like <laughs> she, driving away, and she's, she's just like driving, she's like the yelling, walkie and she, you know, she's like really, she's just like going off, but she's still so in control. You know, and everybody else is, like, frantically Scrambling. trying to get these computers, like, turned back on from sleep mode and because <laughs> nothing was running. You know, and it's just, yeah, it was a, it was a huge scene for uh, the movie. And, yeah, that was, I don't know if that is, like, act two or act three, but it was, yeah, I think it was act two. But, yeah, that was uh, my favorite scene. And I guess everything, like, and, so, like, all the protocols, the steps that they were taking is actually, like, actual protocol if that would be taking. Yeah, it sounded like that. it was highly accurate to yeah. how they talk yeah. and how everything was, yeah. uh, how everything would be handled in a situation. Like <laughs> the that. guy, like, the fucking Hawaiian shirt or whatever. Yep. And then, like, the guy with I, the, yeah, the ponytail. The ponytail. <laughs> I don't know, those moments where I was just like, man. I think you just shut this guy up. Yeah. Whatever doing? it is, it ain't local. <laughs> well, how about he's like carving out the pumpkin? <laughs> the vampire. And then all of a sudden he's like, uh, he, I can't remember what he joke. said, but all of a sudden he's like, he goes down. And I'm like, what's he doing? And gets to, comes up and he's got fangs. Because <laughs> like, I'm a vampire. vampire. <laughs> the old Godfather <laughs> orange <laughs> trick. Where'd you get this guy? <laughs> But yeah, that that scene and uh, another scene too. I I absolutely loved all the scenes with between her and Hammond, and uh, especially the second one when she actually finally meets him. You know, first one wasn't like a face to face, but he knows who she is. But yeah, that second one is uh, pretty awesome. Oh, on the plane. On the plane. Yeah. Well, she had and had what financed her research for about four years at in New Mexico, and well, he, you know, she discovers uh, discovers a signal, Drumlin, you know, great guy Drumlin decides he's just gonna walk in and take over. I mean, she's she's not gonna say nothing about it. He, it's his project now. Well, Haddon obviously understands what's going on. You know, he's a you know, super rich businessman. He knows how to handle with people like this. He has to deal her back in, so he sends for her. And uh, they're trying to figure out what this message is. Well, she ends up talking to him. But he's so mysterious. I don't. She's never seen him face to face. She doesn't know what this guy really is about. You know, she just knows that he, he's got this uh, plan where he was just funding her. Uh for this uh, New Mexico array time. Zemeckis really amps up the drama in this scene, too. It's like the music's real. There's more music, and it's real low-key, but it's there's a lot of music in this section. It's kind of... There's some sections in this, or scenes in this movie that there isn't any music, and it's real just quiet, or it's real orchestrated. But this one, is it just has a constant really dramatic uh, score in the background well he he, he lands because he realizes that ellie's no longer in the game well she's grateful to him but she doesn't know if she can trust him and i think haddon actually doesn't really i don't know if he knows that he could trust her you know he's just kind of like still kind of well let's see you know see where this is gonna go but once she says because he doesn't tell her right away. She guesses that he figured it out, that he figured what he figured where the primer is and how to read this thing. She says it to him. All of a sudden, bam. It was like he just, because he goes, clever girl. <laughs> <laughs> and then all of a sudden, there you go. He just gives her all the goods. You know, and he's like, I'm dealing you back in. <laughs> so, because you test. are my favorite long-term investment. So I don't know what, what the long-term investment part of it is, but... 
Maybe he's looking for immortality. Well, yeah, at that moment where he shows uh, shows the primer to her, they they both realize we're on the same team. You know, there is no one else there. Right. It's uh, because Drumlin, man, that guy is something oh, else. Fucking Drumlin, man. You know, <laughs> he's just like sitting there like always like, you know, this is a waste of money searching for little green men and is always there like, just a fucking yeah. spear in Ellie's well, back throughout that movie. Well, like the then f- when it comes, he's is going to be the one that's going to make fucking contact and take the ride. Fucking Drumlin. Well, his, <laughs> like his first his first line in the movie is like he's on in the jeep down at Arecibo, and then he you know the jeep stops and oh, he's getting all the office job or something. Yeah, like he that. goes. <laughs> I'm so glad I took the office job or something. Yeah, yeah. it's like what the. Yeah. But he just like totally steamrolls her out of just about everything. So that that in itself is another loss to her. I noticed I didn't I noticed this in the movie. Uh, she had this habit when she experienced a loss where she would wrap her arms around her knees with her knees in her chest. And you see that several times in this. You're right. Yeah. When they lose their grant funding, I believe is one of those. You know, I did not catch. There's several times that she does that, and it's uh, there is a scene where she doesn't do that, and they I think they made a point to that. Yeah, so she has this habit of clutching her her knees against her chest, but after the trip, which is a whole nother ball game. It's like you get two movies in this movie <laughs> with a different parts. Yeah, again, I feel like it, I know, for me, it was like, I feel like everything up to um, where she hears, like, the message, mm-hmm. then going through, like, that first part of decoding it, and, like, that is, like, that's kind of, like, the turning point of the movie, because I think after that, you don't get any more flashbacks no, of, you her, don't, of her childhood either. No, it's all, like, moving no. forward. Yeah, um, because I feel like that's almost like that's been like her. So it's kind of showing like ever since she was a little girl, she's trying to reach out to make this contact, especially when she's always talking about like, well, how far can we reach out? Like the moon, you know, Jupiter, Saturn, like, like she's just trying to reach out and <clears throat> the idea of like there being more life out there and like the quote of her father saying, well, it'd be an awful waste of space if there if there wasn't more life out there. So. I, for me, that was kind of like I was seeing this. This okay. This is a turning point. Now everything is is moving forward. Ellie has made her contact. This has kind of been like her 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 moment, her motivation in life. This has been her. This is her moment. Now the next part of it is is like having people fucking rob her of that moment. You know, it's like it's Drumlin. It's even Palmer. It's in moments and like just for their own selfish selfish ambition to like because they want to have somebody that's like. You know, they want to have somebody that believes in God to go travel to space. It doesn't matter if they're moral or not. And, like, Drumlin just uses that against them, and he says that to Ellie herself and be like... He just tells not the Palmer word. what he wants to what hear. What he wants to hear, yeah. You know, another great scene in this movie, though, is probably the... the um, well, I'm trying to think now. Where are we in this? Is it when they're... Um, it's like when they're trying to pick um, somebody to to go in the machine seats like when they're they're questioning her and they're like challenging her on like you know her belief in god or does she believe in god um oh yeah but one they, part i like about that is know, like question that they pose to her um before palmer basically torpedoes her chance yeah 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 because but she had been asked some pretty good questions before that too so they ask her like <laughs> If they were he, she would pose one question to the the vegans, like what it would be, and and she was like, "How do you do it? How did you evolve? How did you survive this technological adolescence without destroying yourself?" I don't know. I don't, I don't have it ready to describe this really, but I just think that's a really powerful scene. It is, yeah, very powerful. They actually were gonna allow her to do her closing statement, and then Palmer basically is like, "Well, Palmer just says, uh, can I have one more question.'" And he asked, are, are you a spiritual person? And then 
she gets thrown off, you know, and, and, uh, I don't know how, you know, this is relevant. And then it was somebody else that chimed in and then somebody else chimed yeah. in. So it like was like 95% that. of the world believes yeah. in the higher being or deity or whatever. And like, you know, and then he finally does ask her, do you believe in God? And she basically says, she knows she lost her chance. Yep. There's another, <clears throat> there's another thing. And that's when he, that's when he gets his compass back. After I don't know how many years, like ten years, I think this movie takes place over, maybe longer. The scene where she's making contact, like she ends up on like that beach, and there's like the palm trees and oh, everything, yeah, yeah, and for that's sure. the yep, uh, we have to talk. That's about from that. Yeah. that picture that she colors in the very first scene. Of oh the movie. my god! I was I wondering that, and her dad pins that up on. I was rewatching the movie right before I came over, but I couldn't get to that scene in time. But oh, that like thought, that yeah. thought, you know, I didn't catch it. It, it was though. Yeah. With the crooked palm. Yeah. And oh, okay. Yeah. Welcome like to the it, conversation, it, Jamie. I completely <laughs> missed that when we were watching it, or when I was watching it. But yeah, so I thought that was very cool. It kind of pulls in like, you know, it's are they reading? Just kind of how they're whatever alien being this is like what they're pulling from her it must be from her mind or whatever and i think she kind of mentions it but i don't remember exactly what she says but so it's like that then it's like her dad coming up to her and saying like you know like whatever calls her sparks and that's what her dad yeah. name was for her. and it's kind of yeah. very touching moments and like movies like this has anything to do with like dealing with like a deceased parent like i i always love them like it just, it's always so hard for me. It just always like strikes a, a um, you know, it always makes me teary eyed and stuff like that. So, but I really like that scene. It was, I think it was done very well. And you get this nice, like, it's, it's this, it's a nice moment too for the character Ellie because this is kind of like her, her moment. Like, she is, um, until she comes back. Yeah. Right. Well, we well, talk about that, but yeah, quick. I think that she also finally gets closure with her dad, too. Yeah, right. You know, because yeah. that was since uh, she didn't get the chance to say goodbye. He right. just, you know, fell over and died. Right. But yeah, I, the more that we're talking about her and um, <clears throat> the job that Jodie Foster did with the role, it just occurred to me that she's just such an authentic character. You know, a true to herself, true as a scientist. Maybe that's a result of being a scientist, but. There's just no bullshit about her. Like, Lee, when you mentioned, um, well, I guess, Chad, we, we were all talking about it when they're interviewing her, whether or not she should be the representative for humanity. And Palmer asked her, do you believe in God? She could have lied. You know, it's her one shot to talk to aliens. Right. No one would know. Yeah. Sure. I believe in God. Even yeah. if, she, you know, in her heart, she doesn't believe it, but she can't bring herself to, you know, say that lie, even though it's one of the greatest scientific moments in humanity yeah so i i mean that didn't occur to me until just now that we were talking about her but yeah i had that moment of, oh wow she really is you know a very transparent very authentic no bullshit character yeah because if she if she would have lied the only one that would have known would would have been palmer right and that would have been one vote she would have got probably every other vote right you know but she just, that's not who she is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not willing to lie to him at all, even yeah. when he leaves her the note and wants her to, you know, come back or hang around. She's just like, I don't have time for this, and I don't want to, <laughs> you know, hurt him and pretend that I do. I got yeah. stuff to work on. Yeah. And it, that was that was shortly after a conversation about her family, too. So right. That kind of freaked her out, I thought. Yeah, Palmer uh, sees a picture of her and her dad. And then I think he asked about her, her mom, too. But she never yeah. knew her mom. I didn't realize this. Yeah, I think she said she died in like childbirth. in childbirth. Yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, Palmer uh, talks about her family. And then as she's leaving, she sees that shooting star out in uh, Puerto Rico. And then. That's when, that's when we go into the flashbacks because it's like the play. meteor shower. Yeah. Yep. So. 
you know, Palmer, though, like that's before that too. Palmer says the same thing to Ellie as they're looking up to the stars. He's like, she's explaining to he him does, like the billions he? and millions of planets has billions of whatever. Like the possibility of life is, you know, endless. And he's like, well, you know, if there wasn't, it'd be an awful waste of space again. But yeah, you know, she's almost it. It she has a really funny reaction to that, you know. Jodie Foster is a pretty good actress or actor. And, uh, yeah, she has, like, a really weird, like, oh, my God, type right, of look. Right, Yeah, and then uh, then she's, like, really into him <laughs> after that. But... Play the dad card. <laughs> what she's do you like, do? Because, you know, cause, <laughs> you know it, she probably worked it out in her head. She's probably, like, there's no way that he talked to my dad and right. used the same line, you know. He just, he just happened to yeah, kind of the same thing. I, I guess I don't know. But. I want to go back to you know like we we're talking about the scene where, again, where uh, Palmer torpedoes um, Ellie in that conversation when they're questioning her. Is is it the night before that then when they're at that like dinner party, right? Because like yep. Palmer that night when they're out on that balcony, yep. he asks asks her again. They're talking about like pr- essentially like faith and like believing in God or like needing proof yeah. of the God. Then he's just like. Do you love your family, or did you love your father? Yeah. She's like, yeah. He's like, prove it. Yeah. And she's just like, she's like, oh, you Palmer. <laughs> Boy, I oughta. You got me. You know, you got me again. But that the funny thing about that night is that that day, you know, had been the first day that they had seen each other since Puerto Rico. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is, you know, could be five, six years, maybe. Maybe what, maybe four or five years. How long do you At think it point, took him to build even... that machine? Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, the machine could have been. It could have took two of them. <laughs> it could have took like four or five years to build it. What was it? Hundreds of trillions of dollars. Yeah. Or something? <laughs> Yeah, here's where we need a scientist to tell us how long their <laughs> projects are funded right. for. Right. Yeah. It's a project funded by every everybody on Earth, basically. Yeah. And yeah, it was something. But the machine and the chair. The machine, the machine chair. chair. <laughs> they get a pass for a very large array because that's, like, kind of funny. Yeah. I, I, I think that's funny. <laughs> When they're out on the balcony talking, they, she brings up Occam's razor, and yeah. then they have that discussion. <clears throat> oh, a, I think about Occam's razor. That's and in I, the very I'm, end scene after. But, but that's in the end scene yeah. with uh, James Woods, and he yeah. brings it up and uses uses Doctor, it against her. Are yep. you familiar with the scientific precept known as Occam's razor? Yes. It means that all things being equal, the simplest explanation tends to be the right one. Exactly. Now, you tell me, what is more likely here? That a message from aliens results in a magical machine that whisks you away to the center of the galaxy to go windsurfing with dear old dad, and then a split second later returns you home without a single shred of proof. But, yeah, I I couldn't help but think, too, as they were going through Occam's razor there's and specifically with the James Woods character there is a scientist I wish I, his name is escaping me now but he has a TED talk pretty much about this point about um intelligent life within the universe and he takes I guess the James Woods angle and basically says you know why haven't we heard from them why haven't they contacted us and the simplest theory is that they just don't exist that is the simplest theory. I mean, we've tested it. We can't. That's what we've tested. That's the result. You know, I mean, the math states that they they should be there, but Occam's razor suggests that they're not. Yeah. But I think Ellie, in a way, is using Occam's razor is that she explains it in, in that moment with Palmer, like when they first meet, is like there's millions of billions of star or galaxies and there's if just one million of those had like plants and just like one million of those like the 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 possibility of there just being like life on this one single planet amongst this vastness of the universe 
doesn't you like the simplest explanation would be like actually no there should be like everything else repeats in the universe like right it's not like there's just like one galaxy there's not like one solar system there's not like one star in this one galaxy it's like everything is kind of you uni- there's uniformity to it too amongst the chaos right and she's you know again you see moments of that too and she's like she's like listening to like washing machines to like find stuff in the chaos or like static <laughs> on tv <TVs> or... <laughs> so or i think there's also like the, was it the queen of the desert or the sorceress oh, yeah, of the desert yeah. they started yeah. calling her yeah. <laughs> she doesn't she say something like oh no it was in the commentary jody foster's like yeah it, it's just weird that they or was it in the movie i i can't remember now Anyway, they talked about, you know, she says, or they talk about her in that respect, and then doesn't she rebut that with, that's weird because I don't even believe in anything. (laughs) I'm an atheist. (laughs) So I don't know. But, well, the one thing, uh, the one thing that I think if we're talking about the end part and uh, what she sees and this and that, she can't explain it. Mm -hmm. She, it kind of goes back. I gotta. We gotta bring it back to that conversation on the frickin', on the balcony once again with Palmer because she almost. She's not quite, but she almost is making fun of Palmer for having faith in God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then she, you know, fast forward through the movie to uh, where she. You know, she gets dropped in the ball. She goes off into the wormholes. She sees, you know, the alien. They have a conversation, and they and she comes back, and uh, she's just, you know, she knows that she that something happened. Something happened to her. She knows that she could be crazy. She could be this or that. Mm-hmm. Well, James Woods actually comes. You know, I can't remember his character's name. Uh, he's the NSA guy. Michael, Michael Kitts. So Kitts quite says, so, you know, he just starts laying it out. 1.1, 1. 1, 0. 0.2, 0. 0.3, 0. 0.4. So with all the answers that you gave me, you expect us to, you know, you expect to, you expect us to believe what happened to you simply on faith. And the table has been turned on her. That that's like one of the things that I th- that I absolutely love about this movie, is because she's so secure in her non faith, but when something as great as the trip that she had happens to her, right, she can't explain it. Yeah. Science cannot explain it. She internalizes it as I have to take this on faith, and she is absolutely in foreign territory at that point but she knows that as a scientist she just has to power through it and under try to understand what's going on with with that which i thought was really awesome yeah well and it's also cool too because as a viewer it's still i mean in the moment i guess i was trying to parcel whether or not she's actually talking to an alien or just deep in her own, the wormhole of her own consciousness because I was too. Yeah. yeah. Everything we're presented with. I mean, the beach, which I was big, dumb, dumb, didn't realize was I from her room. I didn't either. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen it countless times, <laughs> but her dad, her aspirations oh, to talk to these aliens. And I think too, I, I mean, if you, I guess the moment I would pin it to was, um, the James Woods, Angela Bassett, confirmation like corroborated by a second yeah. source is that 18 hours of static or whatever they're referencing yep so you know when he in her when video she camera. is like asking him asking him about the length of the video because it seems like they're talking about the report because the static did come up yeah and like yeah she's like well did you read the report he's like yeah and she's like well the, about the 18 hours of video so it's like it's like james woods knew in the report that that this existed and like there's yeah. it's like he was hiding it in a way mm-hmm. but in the end like they do agree to like give her more funding again but yeah and i think this kind of goes back to the 90s too where the bureaucrats are 
they're always trying to hide stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh. Yeah. She's. I, you know. I uh, apparently in the book. I haven't read the book, but apparently in the book there were two other pieces of evidence that showed that she did go on this journey. Oh, that she did. And there yeah. was multiple people that went on it. I think as well. That like I'm a, not sure. A group of five, okay. I think. Okay. I had read. Okay. Yeah. 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 I do like that though about him. The just the government agent who knows everything, but it's gonna make you believe that he knows nothing. That's just right. great sort of lore and background there with American conspiracy theories and probably mm-hmm. some of which are true, if I'm you know, just to keep the peace or just the status quo for the most part. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. How about uh, Busey? Should we talk about Busey? Is this Jake Busey? Jake Busey, the son of uh, yeah. Gary Busey. Yeah, you know, yeah, old yeah. canines himself. Yeah, <laughs> she, he's got. This... So he really just has like three big scenes, right? So it's the That's first it, yeah. scene, like in the Vega, uh, like encampment. Yep. Say, and then he like singles well. her out. Then it's the uh, when they're going to like the dinner party. Yes, he's like waiting in line, or he's outside and gives her like a stare down. Yep, he's kind of like you know dressed in um, not crazy evangelical clothing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. I think he still has the long hair at that point. Yes, yes. And then the yep. next time we see him, it's uh, he's he shaved his head. Or whatever, he's got yeah. shorter hair. Shorter hair, like, yeah. Dressed up as like one of like the machine mechanics uh, or so whatever, and yeah. like he's got a bomb strapped to himself. And yeah. at least he takes out Drumlin. Yeah, yeah. You know, like <laughs> Drumlin got what he deserved. Did he not? Yeah. Like he he used as at least like was always there to like stop like this project that Ellie was working on. Then like she discovers something, and he's like, "No, fuck you, I'm gonna do it." <laughs> <laughs> then he gets blown to shit. So, <laughs> yeah. If I had one, if I had and one, she's nitpick. such a nice person. She tries to stop it. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. So, again, she didn't. No, have if to. I was her, I would just like quietly snuck. <laughs> But what? No, it's like she was. Maybe she's just acting in her own like. Well, in her own self interest. Self interest, because then like she didn't know that there was a second machine. Yeah. Well, she didn't want to see the thing. She she probably wanted to save the machine a little more than drum one. No, I if I had one, um, I didn't even. Yeah, maybe it's a nitpick. We'll say nitpick, and maybe this is where watching it with modern eyes comes into play. Is that Jake Busey? How does he get onto that machine? That was all yeah. learned too. Yeah. yeah, it was like a... Yeah, there are some a lot of leaps in this movie, and that's yeah. where part yeah. of it is, is like, and this there... is my first time watching it too, like this movie is like, this movie feels like a 90s movie, and I still can't pin yeah. it down, but like, I... everything apart this this movie, like, it's like, it's very the yeah. of a 90s like, movie. Especially the relationships, there are a lot of standard tropes. But, and yeah, a lot of the yes. relationships, it's the music swells. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, trying to get your emotions, you know. Yep, it's it's there. <laughs> accordingly, yeah. Yes. Yep. A soundtrack, I don't think there's much to talk about. Do we have a composer credit? Al- Alvin Silvestri. Silvestri. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, that sounds familiar. familiar. I've heard of that I mean, guy. best known yeah, for he, Back to the Future. He does most of his Amacus's stuff, yeah. I oh, okay. believe. Yeah. Back to the Future's Back got the future, some bangers. Did the original oh, yeah, Predator. Yeah. Predator. Oh, so, yeah. That's my he's shit. Done, he's Didn't done he do like, like a lot like of the MCU Commando movies. I, I think he did do Commando. Yeah, Commando. Okay, Alan Silvestri. Know him mm. better than I thought I did. Mm. Yep, for, oh, yeah, for sure. Then, like, as far as, like, the... Uh, I know he touched a little bit, little bit on the effects and, like, movie tricks and... It's like the, what I was trying to get to earlier was like a lot of like the movie tricks in the in the film are done very well, but a lot of like the CGI stuff, like the machine CGI, is has not aged very well. Um, but other than that, I think a lot of the effects were done pretty good in this movie. Yeah, can't like really. If they were subtle, like I guess air, at the Arecibo, uh, the the actual antenna part, they yeah, digitally they to, cleaned it up. Yeah, I guess it was like just it was dirt. It was just real dirty, so they actually made it look a little nicer. Oh, I didn't so even notice. So simple things like that. I'm glad they got it built in time after Bond blew it up. Right. Yeah. yeah it was uh, a quick work there. <laughs> yeah, it was a good death. 
That was a good death. But yeah, <laughs> but even, like so, like the the machine stuff was kind of bad, and like when it, when it was like blowing up was kind of yeah, it was pretty bad. But but I one thing I will say about that though is or didn't age well. I don't. It didn't age well, but I I guess I almost give it a pass just for how old the movie is versus like seeing bad CGI now. It almost feels like there's no excuse, you know. It just it pisses yeah, me off oh yeah. if I'm watching a movie yeah. now and the CGI is not good. Yeah, I just think this is if this is how we're making movies and you guys can't even do it correctly. Right. What's the point? Because even like the scene where, like where she's like making contact and it's like the, it's on like that the beach with the palm trees and meets your father like. It's kind of like well, but it's oh, like it's they, supposed to look that way because it's yeah, like kind of based off like her 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 drawing. So right, yep, that one was totally overblown. Yeah, and that was meant to be like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, there was one effect that we didn't talk about, and I I totally missed it. Like every time I ever saw this, when she's in the pod, and uh, opens up, you know through the side, and she sees like that galaxy through there, yeah. and she's just like. You just, you know, she just lights up. It's like the best thing she's ever seen in her life. And she starts smiling. Uh, Jodie Foster in the commentary said that she had to keep her face really still because they basically put the child actor's face on for short splits, you know, like for a short time. And then it came back off. I didn't realize that. I'm really glad you said that. I remember real time thinking. So, something's going on here. I wasn't aware yeah. of what it was, but yeah, I remember thinking something about her face right. is not. Yeah, it right. <laughs> yep, ended up being the child's face for a short time, and then went oh, back to okay. yeah, you know, Jodie Foster's. All right, cool. Yeah, she, the, the little girl did a really great job. I thought. Oh yeah, too. amazing, so, amazing. Yeah. Another cool thing they did too is like a, a tiny thing, and that's probably not that difficult by today's standards. Was just like coloring her eyes to match. Jodie Foster's blue eyes, but yeah. all right, let's move on to final thoughts. Um, this movie would probably do well at getting uh, a remake today, um, and maybe even like a TV series based on like the number of characters that are in the book. And I really like to read the book to to kind of flush that flush that idea out. So I, I I like the movie. I think it's it's a really good movie. Uh, I think you should see it. But I think it's probably like due for like a remake. I think I would really like to see this story updated. And after kind of seeing El- Interstellar too, I was like, I don't know, like <laughs> I don't know if maybe that is the remake, kind of in a way. But but I don't know. That's that's my thoughts on it. Like, what do you think, Jamie? Yeah, I I guess I would I would support a remake. I I would watch it. Um, I, I loved it. I, um, missed the original Carl Sagan and his cosmos. I just was too young. It was before my time, but I got into the Neil deGrasse Tyson reboot. Um, it's on Netflix. I don't know if it still is. I, Fox is kind of redistributing those properties. I don't know if it is or not. Yeah. Yeah. I think they might've pulled it. Um, unfortunately before I got to finish it, but if you can find it, I would recommend it. It's really, really cool. And he talks about Carl throughout the series as well but and it also it always just i don't know jealousy is not the right word but also respect when someone's so brilliant with you know as far as science can write fiction like this it's just almost unfair that a mind can be that yeah that brilliant um i'm thankful for it but um yeah i I, i'm rambling but all of that is to say that I, i would welcome a remake and at the same time, I love all of the 90s elements about this movie as mm-hmm. well. Um, yeah. And it is just refreshing in um, a box office just so dominated by Disney and remakes and supers. Some of which I, I do love, don't get me wrong, but it's just refreshing to revisit a film about higher themes and concepts. Right. True. So, yeah, that's what I have to say about that. So, Lee, now that you picked this for your movie, like, how long have you gone before you've revisited this movie? Or is this something that you watch occasionally? Or yeah, or I, I pull this one out this? For, occasionally. Yeah, yeah, just every so often. Not like every year, you know, something like that. Yeah, I mean, I it probably well, 
I bought the Blu-ray, so I watched it. Watched it, but I hadn't probably watched it in like ten years before that, possibly. Okay. You know, so it's uh, it's one that I I've watched it obviously a couple of times, even before this, since I've gotten the Blu-ray. Yeah, but yeah, because it it looks fantastic and high def. You know, it's 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 really we live in a time that's pretty awesome when it comes to these old standards these old movies like this because we can actually see them again how we would have seen them in the theater right it is it's it's been great for me you know to you know just pick up some of these older movies on blu-ray because you can get them dirt cheap now a lot of them like this one i think i paid like six bucks for (laughs) yeah you know and looks fantastic you know and it it's uh it's a movie that, yeah, I totally agree, Jamie, that it just, there's there's elements of it that are completely 90s. It was kind of, you know, I was in my 20s in the 90s, and, you know, you, you don't really think of that stuff, but when you revisit it, it's like, oh, yeah, there's some, yeah, that's some quirky little thing that, you know, they used to do, or, or the movies were, you know, they look like, they're really austere, in the 90s, like some of these big budget ones, because I think it was because of the computer graphics. They didn't really want to, like, they thought they needed to make them that way, mm-hmm. I think. Right. Instead of having a warmth, you know, of film. and Because even, like, Lucas was trying to get away from film. Yeah, he wanted to go out. Because uh, the, the prequels, they were all shot with the HD cameras. Well, I ended up just biting them in the end, you know? Right. Because film really has a lot of resolution. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, they weren't quite there yet. I digress. Anyway, so I think with this uh, with this movie, I definitely recommend it. I recommend it if, uh, if you just have some questions about, you know, just anything. Like uh, if you have some, ish, you know, things that – if you have some questions of, you know, like say faith versus uh, – you know, science. I mean, this is definitely the movie. If you have any, if you have any uh, questions about Carl Sagan, kind of, you know, what he is all about, this is kind of a good nutshell. I mean, it's really entertaining. Cosmos is, uh, it's entertaining, but it can get a little dry. I find mm-hmm. myself kind of hard to get through Carl Sagan's Cosmos. I haven't watched the new one with uh, Neil deGrasse, but. Uh, yeah, I just I enjoyed the performances. Uh, all the act, the actors are just excellent in this. Uh, Jodie Foster. I think with her character, she there's no way she would want to Oscar with this role, but she does a great job with it. Mm-hmm. It is a it is all '90s. You know, haven't seen her in uh, uh, Silence of the Lambs. She definitely uh, deserved that one when she got that but yeah the just uh have it it's a sit you know because it's uh what two and a half hours long so it does take up some time it does pay it off in the end i believe just you know she definitely needs to uh really you know think about what faith really is i mean I mean, even even if you are an atheist, I think there are there's certain elements, and I think Carl Sagan was trying to say this in this movie that you you basically have to have faith in order to actually achieve the next step, because you can't just always be scientific about something. And I think she understood that at the end, and that's where she was sitting was at that canyon. But she didn't have the same pose. She didn't have her knees up mm-hmm. on her. You know, she didn't have everything wrapped up. She was just, it looked, she looked content at the end. Yep. Mm-hmm. So that was pretty cool. After, you know, teaching the kids about, you know, yeah. certain things. And she gets that, the line gets in there one more time again, like, you know, the, the you know, awful, not, there'd be an awful waste of space. Yeah. But. Yeah, again, I just I wanted to put in this this quote from Carl Sagan where he says, "Science is not only compatible with spirituality; it is a profound source of spirituality." And I think that is pretty much sums up hmm. this movie. So, 
yeah yeah overall it, it, it overall it's uh i recommend it all right cool why don't we just go around and just kind of let's just say tell everyone what what we're streaming right now really quick then we'll close her out so jamie what have you been watching lately <laughs> oh great question chad i have a couple things on my list i well as it is um time of recording july 12th that means stranger things season three just dropped i see it here on your list so i won't steal too much of your thunder but i've been watching it enjoying it um big fan of the series i thought they took the story in some pretty cool places um for yeah season three so i would highly recommend it and i don't want to say more unless i spoil it um i also saw a movie but it's called the sisters brothers it was 2018 it's um John C. Riley and Joaquin Phoenix. It's a Western. They play two outlaw mercenary brothers All right. who end up, um, they get this bounty to track down a, um, help uh, me out Prospector? Here. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, they're tracking down a prospector. And I don't want to reveal too much about that plot either, but um, there's some great Western stuff there. Uh, John C. Riley and Joaquin Phoenix playing off of each other is just, two powerhouse actors is really fun to watch and the action's good i i highly recommend it if you have the time it's the sisters brothers and um lastly on netflix jeff ross's historical roasts has been <laughs> taking up a lot of my comedy time which if you don't know um roast master jeff ross they kind of it's it's like almost got a drunk history vibe but with roasts so they uh, the one I saw, they roasted Abe Lincoln, which was Bob Saget in Abe Lincoln <laughs> attire. <laughs> and they sit him down, and he's roasted by Mary Todd Lincoln, Harriet Tubman, and John Wilkes Booth. And it's just some funny, not PC shit. I highly <laughs> recommend it. <laughs> that's and, awesome. Yeah, that's that's what I've been streaming. Yeah. Lee? Yeah, I just, uh, I just picked up... Uh remastered copy of this island earth is from 1955 <laughs> so, whoa so they just uh 4k remastered it and just put up ice cream so i'm i just uh, watched about half hour of that before i came over here too and yeah it's it looks pretty good it it definitely is a 55 uh sci-fi movie it's uh got the shrieks and the uh, awesome just theremin the action and, you know, yeah yeah, and then uh, I picked up uh, "They Not They Shall Not Grow Old." Peter Jackson did a uh, commission oh, work really for World, World War this. One. Yeah, I do want to see that. And I was just uh, thinking, thinking about that movie today. Man, that that is something else. And my brother and I saw that in the theater, and they actually did it into 3D in the theater. But I just picked it up on Blu-ray, and uh, yeah, it's. What they did, if if no one's aware of this, what they actually did, uh, Peter Jackson using computer technology has taken old World War One footage and basically updated it into uh, the the exact frame rate that we use now. Because a lot of the, a lot of the movies back then were their frame rates were all different. So a lot of them, if you ever watched it, they just look like they're marching super fast. Yeah. Well, that was because the frame rates were so low, like 14s or something like that. But yeah, he's changed it, and then he's cleaned up, cleaned it up. And then he uh, took audio. He has a lot of interviews with World War One vets. I don't know where the, I can't remember where these came from, but then he has uh, like audio tracks to the images. So explosions and hmm. guys, wow. they, he, he, he had to do voice actors, obviously, because yeah. none of these people are alive anymore. But he had uh, voice actors, you know, basically saying the lines that they lip lip read, lip read what these guys were saying. Yeah, it's so they not could, like this trailer I saw for that was just it, like yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Starts off, it's just like a little screen like this big, you know, on your TV, whatever, just like a little eight millimeter, and then it just slowly gets bigger. That's so Ken Burns eat your heart out. That's so cool. <laughs> oh yeah, you know Ken Burns would be like, "What?" <laughs> Ken Burns would tell you three episodes about the tank tread. 
Yep. Yeah. And like the story of it, how far yeah. it went, yeah. how many people died, how many times it got stuck, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> how many yeah. letters it wrote home. The one time that it fell <laughs> off. Yep. <Yeah>, right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how many days it took to put it back on, yeah. you know, stuff like that. And what the guys did while, while that right. operation right. was in was in play. Do they have footage of the French Lee? I've been listening to Dan Carlin's Hardcore History, and he's having oh, a lot of fun at the expense of the French army during yeah, World I War One. It's mostly, I want to say it's mostly the English, but yes, I, I think they had some some French in there, too. Oh, cool, I got to see this. Yeah, it's just whatever he could find. I awesome. guess it was a commission work, so. Awesome. Cool. Anything else? That's... Uh, I got, well, I do have Space 1999 coming. What's this? As a series, is a sci-fi series from the seventies. Yeah. Then what else? Uh, oh yeah, I, I'm waiting for Chernobyl. I, I I wish I could see more of Chernobyl, but I haven't watched past episode one. So, just waiting for that to drop. You're waiting. Other than HBO. Other than HBO. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, well, I mean, I'm not watching much right now besides doing stuff for the podcast. Um, trying to get some Stranger Things in. I'm only about two episodes deep into that, like what I've seen so far. Um, then uh, been watching a lot of Toy Story. Disney yeah. Plus coming soon. Coming plus. I'm yeah. telling you, when that comes here, we got to do maybe a Mandalorian. Yeah. <laughs> we got to do some stuff on the Mandalorian, and that might be really cool. Anyway, that's what we're doing. Let's close this out. Thank you for listening if you made it this far. <laughs> and that concludes episode four of Movie Time Machines Look Into Contact. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, or if there's anything that we got wrong about the movie or anything that you think we should add about, about the movie, about the movie uh, please send us a message. Uh, you can find us at Twitter, um, at Movie Machine Pod. That's on Twitter, at Movie Machine Pod. It's all one word, at Movie Machine Pod. So... Our goal is maybe once you get through the first 10 movies, we want to rank them, and hopefully we get some questions and comments that we can answer when we get to that point too. So thank you very much, and good day. Oh.